creation. So come take a look. Give me the hook or the ovation. It's my world that I want to have a little pride in. My world, and it's not a place I have to hide in. Life's not worth a damn till you can say, hey world, I am who I am. I don't want pity. I bang my own drum. I think it's noise. I think it's pretty. And so what if I love each feather and each spangle? Why not try and see things from a different angle? Your life is a sham till you can shout, hey world, I am who There's no return and no deposit. One life, so it's time to open up your closet. Life's not worth a damn. And when I say, hey, world, I am, oh, I am. God says to Moses, I am who I am. So come, take a look. God offers this invitation to each of us every day, all day long. So come, take a look. I woke up in a panic Friday morning Sermon unwritten and a busy day with my kid stretching in front of me. I rolled out of bed and the urge to immediately hit the computer and start writing was overwhelming. But what flashed gently through my head was a reminder to pray. So, come, take a look. I will admit I've shrugged those reminders off before. Yeah, yeah, I'll pray later. On the subway to somewhere. After I get the kid to bed, hey, sermon writing's a prayer, sort of. <laughs> Thankfully, I listen to this reminder, and I open Sarah Young's meditation book to read this. Demonstrate your trust in me by sitting quietly in my presence. Put aside all that is waiting to be done and refuse to worry about anything. This sacred time together strengthens you and prepares you to face whatever the day will bring by waiting with me before you begin the day's activities. You proclaim the reality of my living presence. I am who I am, God was saying. So come, take a look. Give me the hook or the ovation. Start it too high. <laughs> Prove me wrong, God was saying. Sit down, pray, meditate, watch me show up. And then I could not believe what happened. I meditate at a big picture window in my apartment that looks out over a jolly green tree. As I'm putting my book down, I'm drinking in the green of the tree. The rising sun shines directly in my eyes. The light was warm, it was bright, and it forced me to close my eyes. So I've been staring at the tree for so long that when I closed my eyes, I could still see the image 
behind my closed eyes. But what was also there now was the morning sun burning its radiance into the image behind my closed eyes. So the image of the tree mixed with the brightness of the sunlight and to my closed eyes, it looked like the tree was on fire. I started to cry because I'm preaching about a bush on fire and here's this tree on fire and it only lasted a few minutes until the sun got a little higher in the sky. I would have missed it if I'd gone straight to the computer to work on the sermon. Some preachers, some commentators suggest my experience is the human experience. The bushes, the trees are always on fire and we fail to notice. We go to our computers. We walk through the day unaware and unfocused. God is all around us, and we miss the fire. So come, take a look, God said to Moses. Give me the hook or the ovation. And I had to give God an ovation Friday morning for that tree on fire. God is all around, flamboyant in the rising sun through the trees, gentle as the nudge to stop and be in the holy presence. Here, in the exquisite beauty of the sanctuary, on the downtown one train. I lost some of you on the downtown one train. So, (laughs) let me explain. Jewish spirituality holds an awareness of the presence of God in all things, including, and perhaps most especially, the gross and material things. Most of us can find God in the sanctuary on a Sunday. Most of us can find God at a yoga retreat in the mountains, in the playfulness of a puppy or a baby, but not so much on the downtown one train. Not in the mundane and the profane. I'm not taking my shoes off on the one train because there couldn't possibly, there couldn't possibly be anything holy in there. But the rabbis teach that an evolved spirituality cultivates an awareness of God's holy ground presence in the stinky and surprising places of life. Taking out the garbage, broken relationships, crying babies. I interned in a children's hospital in seminary and I visited a family that had a baby with a degenerative disease. The disease meant the baby would eventually die, but it also meant this baby could not cry. I never saw God in the cries of a baby before until I met this baby who couldn't cry. An evolved spirituality, the rabbis say, cultivates an awareness of God's presence in the stinky and surprising places of life. Moses was looking for lost sheep. Those darn sheep lost again. But just think, if they hadn't gone missing, would Moses have found himself in the presence of God? Would he have even gone looking? So come, take a look. And in the presence of God, on holy ground, God invites us to remove our shoes. In some faith traditions and in many homes, people remove their shoes. This simple action is a sign of comfort and relaxation, a sign of vulnerability, and a sign that you feel at home. If you are willing, I invite you to experience some holy ground presence. Right now, I will ask you to remove your shoes. Go ahead, I'll wait. This is the experiential moment. So let me just say that whether you're in the sanctuary or online, removing your shoes helps us to think about cultivating the presence of God in all things. And if we are able to do that theoretically, we are as at home in our sanctuary and our homes as we are on the downtown one train. 
so if you'd like to carry this out into the world, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> because the point is not whether you take your shoes off on the downtown one train, but can you see God on the one train? And can you see God in all things? Now there's an interesting thing about feet. We hold hands every Sunday morning for the Lord's Prayer, and most of us are comfortable with that. But if I ask you right now to touch your neighbor's feet, <laughs> I'm not going to. <laughs> You're welcome. But imagine if I did. Feet are private body parts. And some of you may know that in Scripture, when they euphemistically refer to feet, they're actually referring to genitals. Did you know that? So when you read about someone in the Bible covering their feet, they're actually talking about something else. It means they covered their private parts. So feet are, in a way, almost that sensitive and that private. They're not the body part we prominently display. And if we do, people notice and sometimes they comment. In fact, in some Christian churches, female leaders do not expose their toes and they do not wear high heels because of the sexy factor. So, feet are ticklish for some of us. They are a source of shame for others of us. Some feet are worn out and misshapen. Some smell or have thick and discolored toenails. <laughs> some feet have corns and bunions, or both. The skin might be cracked at the heel. They might need lotion. Feet are intimate. And God says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. God's invitation is an invitation to intimacy, an invitation to vulnerability, an invitation to relationship. Removing our shoes is a show of respect, it is a show of humility, and perhaps even an act of courage. Perhaps as much an act of courage as taking off all our clothes. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground, God declares. There are rituals described in the Bible that say the removing of sandals rendered contracts null and void, thus creating the possibility for new contracts and new relationships. When God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush, it is the very first conversation they have. And God doesn't waste any time creating a new contract, a new relationship. Moses is tapped to deliver the Hebrew slaves from Egypt. And in that instant, Moses forgets the bush is on fire. What does he do? His reaction to God's enormous request is utterly, utterly human. He wonders what he should say and why anyone would listen to him. He focuses on himself and forgets that the bush is on fire. Theologian Howard Thurman speaks of walking in remembered radiance. In other words, don't forget the bush is on fire and the God who is present with you. But it's so easy to forget. Moses forgets even with the heat from the burning bush warming his face. And God says, I will be with you. Walk in remembered radiance. It means something solid and substantial for God to be with us. The presence of God is not flimsy. It's not ephemeral. It is bushes on fire and sunlight in your eyes. It is bread and wine at a communal table and neighbors holding your hands and perhaps touching your feet. The presence of God is solid and substantial. It claims relationship with us and it gives us new responsibilities, all the while nudging us to walk in remembered radiance. Don't forget the bushes are always on fire. I am always with you. Right now in this place, with your shoes off, the presence of God invites you to feel the fire 
and hear the voice of the God who sends you to do something with your life. Don't worry about what you will say and how you will be received because I am is with you. I am praying for your courageous footing on the holy ground of this sanctuary and the downtown one train. I am praying for nimble feet that allow you to move on behalf of the one who calls and sends you. I am praying for rem remembered radiance of burning bushes and the one who promises to be with you always. I am praying this week and always that you will come take a look. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.